Okay, so um, let's go back to this exercise. We had exercise 3.3. Um, so I asked you to <clears throat> find a solution to the ridge normal equations, which looked like the following form for ordinary least squares. Okay, so if we look at the SVD for x, we have this u d v transpose. Then if we write uh, x transpose x plus lambda i, we can write this as um, v times d squared plus lambda i v transpose. And the point is that um, x transpose x and, and the identity are both simultaneously diagonalizable. That's some, some fact about the identity matrix is that it's si simultaneously diagonalizable with every other diagonalizable matrix. Um, and so we can write this as this V times D squared plus lambda I times V transpose. Um, and all of this is assuming that P is less than N. Otherwise, we have to do a couple of other things, right? Um, but it's still, it's still feasible. Um, and so the rich solution can be shown to be the following thing, which is beta hat is equal to V times D squared plus lambda I inverse times D times U transpose Y. Um, so the, I write this as an exercise. Um, this is in a homework if you're taking my class, um, but you can just verify this on, on pen and paper yourself. Right? In the same way that we derived um, the, the OLS form. Okay, so let's compare this to OLS. Um, so this is beta hat is equal to this V D inverse U transpose Y. Okay. So the, the big difference is in this diagonal matrix here. So if we look at the diagonal matrix here, we have this D squared plus lambda I inverse times D, right? So sort of the units still match. We're still talking about D inverse sized units. Right? But um, the big difference is that lambda is augmenting them by you take your square of the diagonal, which is your singular value, uh, plus lambda divided out by the di this diagonal, and that gives you your new, your new augmented eigenvalues of, or singular values effectively. So that, that's the way that we can think about it. Right. Okay, so that's ridge regression. Um, ridge regression it's going to bias all of your betas towards zero, and it gives you a unique solution to ordinary least squares. But in practice, it's typically, um, if it helps, it's always in, in sort of a minor way, and mostly it's for stability purposes or, or making your al algorithms um, more stable. Right? But um, sometimes you actually want to bias your betas in a way that is in line with your goals, right? So subset selection is an example of this. So um, in subset selection, you want to think about, you know, in ordinary least squares, you have some P predictor variables. But if you only believe that some of them are actually important, then you might want to actually select a subset of them, a subset of the P predictor variables um, that will either lead to lower risk or you believe are actually significant and all of the others are not significant, right? So there's, there's a lot of examples of this um, in epidemiological experiments. You might have some rates of cancer and then you have environmental factors uh, within populations. And you might want to discover a subset of those uh, predictor variables, which are the environmental factors or demographic factors that are actually predictive of um, say the rate of, of lung cancer, for example. So this is a typical example of when you would actually like to do subset selection, not just because you'd like lower risk uh, and, and to regularize your problem, but because you're actually interested in deriving a subset of predictive variables that actually have some effect. So there are two main motivations, lower risk, but also um, finding the subsets, subset which have a large effect. So we're going to incor incorporate this into our linear model by um, imposing a sparsity assumption. So the basic idea is that uh, if we assume that our yi's are equal to that xi transpose beta plus some noise term, epsilon, um, then we can incorporate sparsity just by saying some of these coefficients for beta are actually zero. And that'll mean that a change in that xi, that, uh, that component of xi, 
uh, will not have an impact on the distribution of y because it doesn't change this term and the epsilon is, is independent of x. So that's a model um, in which imposing the sparsity assumption is really saying that there is some subset, subset of the betas that we're interest, interested in. Um, we're going to define something that's sort of convenient for the rest of, throughout the rest of this course. Um, the support of beta are the, are the coefficients, the indices of beta, that are non-zero. Right? So that's the j's such that beta j is non-zero. Now the goal is to find the support of beta or the beta such that the support of beta, the size of it is smaller than or equal to s. So like if I told you that there are five variables that are important, then you would be searching for betas that have a support which is of size smaller than or equal to four. Right? Now, um, subset selection can be introduced as the following combinatorial problem. It's you take some subset of one to p, and for each of them, you could compute the ordinary least squares objective. Right? Um, now, what you would like to do is find the subset that gives you the smallest OLS objective, which is the smallest minimum, um, uh, the smallest minimizer of, of this ordinary least squares. So you could imagine for every single subset, what I do is I run ordinary least squares. So for variables 1, 3, and 7, I run ordinary least squares just on those variables. Then I do it again for 1, 2, and 7. I do it for one, two, and five. And I do this for every subset, right? That's less than or equal to three, for example. Right? Now the issue is that there are P choose three of those, right? And that's why we call this combinatorial because that's going to scale like P to the third, right? If P exceeds three significantly enough. And so um, that's why this, is, this being a combinatorial optimization is generally NP hard. Um, where NP is in, in, this, in this P, right? So I said it was P cubed in that case. It could be, um, if this little s is growing with P, it could be um, exponential in, in P, in that sense, the, the, the computational hardness of this. So we're actually, this is our first example, which is sort of canonical in machine learning, where we have a statistical problem that we would like to solve which is this combinatorial subset selection, but computationally, we can't solve it, right? We can't do it in some reasonable amount of time. It's an NB hard problem. And so um, we're going to come up with some uh, computational, computationally feasible surrogate for this combinatorial optimization, or we're gonna come up with heuristic algorithms that try to solve this problem. So this is a situation, this is our first situation that we've come across where we would like to do one thing uh, as statisticians, but as computer scientists, we can't do it. So we have to do something else. Um, and that's why, that's how we're going to get the lasso and um, greedy algorithms like forward selection and so on, because they're going to be attempting to solve this combinatorial optimization, which is subset selection. Okay. So um, we can write this in a more succinct way just by defining something that we call the L0 norm. This is not actually, this should be the size of the support of beta, not the support of beta. Um, the L0 norm is the number of elements in the support of beta. And subset selection is just, let's find the beta such that um, this L0 norm of beta is bounded by S, right? So the number of non-zero elements of beta is bounded by S. Now this is not a norm, and this is a highly non-convex set. So it, it's actually really hard to, hard to solve this problem. But there are heuristics out there, like greedy methods, right? And we'll talk about in, in the next lectures why greedy methods aren't necessarily going to do that well. Um, forward stepwise is an example of this. And the basic idea, it's very simple. At each step, you just choose an action that improves your empirical risk. This is generally what greedy methods are going to do. Um, and so the basic idea is that we're going to input X, which is standardized. We're going to start with a standardized X's. Then we're going to start with a um, subset, which is just the empty set. Right? And then for every S, we're just going to, or it's, it's just the intercept. So we're going to start with the intercept in the model. And then for every, um, for, for every step in each iteration, we're going to go through all of the coefficients 
So this is all of the variables, the predictor variables that are not in our current set. And we're going to um, compute its OLS and its OLS objective. So it's training error uh, for ordinary least squares. For, uh, for the model, which is our previous model, so maybe at the beginning we start with just the intercept. Now we try the intercept plus every other variable. We compute our OLS and look at our uh, empirical risk, which is our training error. And then we're just going to choose the J that minimizes this training error and then update S, uh, our subset, to include that J. So we're just going to go through this. So maybe at the beginning we would start with the intercept and then we would add in variable three. And then we would go through it again, and we would find that adding in to the intercept in variable three, variable four is the next variable that's going to improve our training error. Now we can continue to do this, and notice that the computational complexity scales with p squared, right? Because we have p of these steps, and in each of them we have to try um, on the order of p, um, on the order of p, additional variables. And that's not even counting the complexity of ordinary least squares. So this actually is very slow. Um, now, correlations can actually cause issues. So you can think about if a variable actually isn't, um, wouldn't be added in to our model, but it's correlated, you know, if we could do the combinatorial optimization, but it's correlated with a lot of other variables which are in the model, which are important, then it could get added in at the very beginning because this is a greedy algorithm even if it's not something we would add in if we were to do the combinatorial optimization. It could get added in at the very beginning because it's a greedy method, and it would never leave because it's a greedy method, and it, there, there are no leaving steps in this, in this, in this algorithm. Right? Um, and so this is, this is an issue that we're going to address using uh, the lasso and looking at leaving events, what triggers leaving events in the lasso. Um, but yeah. So this is our first method that we have that attempts, at least, to solve um, the combinatorial problem, which is subset selection, which is listed here. 